Synopsis of the Books of the Bible. 1 John. By J. N. Darby. New Testament. 1 John. Chapter 1. The Person of the Son, the Eternal Life Manifested in the Flesh. 1 John 1. But we must turn to our epistle. There were many pretensions to new light, to clearer views. It was said that Christianity was very good as an elementary thing, but that it was grown old, and that there was a new light which went far beyond that while I truth. The person of our Lord, the true manifestation of the divine life itself, dissipated all those proud pretensions, those exaltations of the human mind under the influence of the enemy, which did but obscure truth, and lead the mind of men back into the darkness whence they themselves proceeded. That which was from the beginning, of Christianity, that is, in the person of Christ, that which they had heard, had seen with their own eyes, had contemplated, had touched with their own hands, of the word of life, that was it which the apostle declared. For the life itself had been manifested. That life which was with the Father had been manifested to the disciples. Could there be anything more perfect, more excellent, any development more admirable in the eyes of God, than Christ himself? than that life which was with the Father, manifested in all its perfection in the person of the Son? As soon as the person of the Son is the object of our faith, we feel that perfection must have been at the beginning. The person then of the Son, the eternal life manifested in the flesh, is our subject in this epistle. The conditional promise of the law and life coming in grace, the Saviour presented first before God's character is revealed. Grace is consequently to be remarked here in that which regards life, while Paul presents it in connection with justification. The law promised life upon obedience, but life came in the person of Jesus, in all its own divine perfection, in its human manifestations. Oh, how precious is the truth that this life, such as it was with the Father, such as it was in Jesus, is given to us. In what relationships it sets us, by the power of the Holy Ghost with the Father and with the Son himself. And this is what the Spirit here first sets before us. And observe, how it is all grace here. Farther on, indeed, he tests all pretensions to the possession of fellowship with God, by displaying God's own character, a character from which he can never deviate. But, before entering on this, he presents the Saviour himself and communion with the Father and the Son by this means, without question and without modification. This is our position and our eternal joy. Life not known without knowing the Son, communion with Him. The Apostle had seen that life, had touched it with his own hands, and he wrote to others, proclaiming this, in order that they also should have communion with Him in the knowledge of the life which had been thus manifested. See note. Now, inasmuch as that life was the Son, it could not be known without knowing the Son, that is, that which He was, entering into His thoughts, his feelings, otherwise he is not really known. It was thus they had communion with him, with the Son. Precious fact. To enter into the thoughts, all the thoughts, and into the feelings, of the Son of God come down in grace, to do this in fellowship with him, that is to say, not only knowing them but sharing these thoughts and feelings with him. In effect, it is life. Note. The life has been manifested. Therefore we have no longer to seek for it to grope after it in the darkness, to explore at random the indefinite, or the obscurity of our own hearts, in order to find it, to labor fruitlessly under the law, in order to obtain it. We behold it, it is revealed, it is here, in Jesus Christ. He who possesses Christ possesses that life. End of note. Communion with the Son entailing communion with the Father. But we cannot have the Son without having the Father. He who had seen him had seen the Father, and consequently, he who had communion with the Son had communion with the Father, for their thoughts and feelings were all one. He is in the Father and the Father in him. We have fellowship therefore with the Father. And this is true also when we look at it in another aspect. We know that the Father has entire delight in the Son. Now he has given us, by revealing the Son, to take our delight in him also, feeble as we are. I know when I am delighting in Jesus, in his obedience, his love to his Father, to us, his single eye and purely devoted heart, I have the same feelings, the same thoughts, as the Father himself. In that the Father delights, cannot but delight, in him in whom I now delight, 
I have communion with the Father. So with the Son in the knowledge of the Father. All this flows, whether in the one or the other point of view, from the person of the Son. Herein our joy is full. What can we have more than the Father and the Son? What more perfect happiness than the community of thoughts, feelings, joys, and communion, with the Father and the Son, deriving all our joy from themselves? And if it seems difficult to believe, let us remember that, in truth, it cannot be otherwise, for, in the life of Christ, the Holy Ghost is the source of my thoughts, feelings, communion, and He cannot give thoughts different from those of the Father and the Son. They must be in their nature the same. To say that they are adoring thoughts is in the very nature of things, and only makes them more precious. To say that they are feeble and often hindered, while the Father and the Son are divine and perfect, is, if true, to say the Father and the Son are God, are divine, and we feeble creatures. That surely none will deny. But if the blessed Spirit be the source, they must be the same as to nature and fact. This is our Christian position then, here below in time, through the knowledge of the Son of God, as the Apostle says, These things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. The only begotten making God known, the revelation of his nature as light, excluding all that, is not itself. But he who was the life which came from the Father has brought us the knowledge of God. See note 1. The Apostle had heard from his lips that which God was, knowledge of priceless value, but which searches the heart. And this also the Apostle, on the Lord's part, announces to believers. This then is the message which they had heard from him, namely, that God is light, and in him is no darkness. With regard to Christ, he spoke that which he knew and bore testimony to that which he had seen. No one had been in heaven, save he who came down from thence. No one had seen God. The only begotten, who is in the bosom of the Father, he had declared him. No one had seen the Father, save he who was of God, he had seen the Father. Thus he could, of his own and perfect knowledge, reveal him. See note 2. Now God was light, perfect purity, which makes manifest at the same time all that is pure, and all that is not so. To have communion with light, one must oneself be light, be of its nature, and fit to be seen in the perfect light. It can only be linked with that which is of itself. If there is anything else that mingles with it, light is no longer light. It is absolute in its nature, so as to exclude all that is not itself. Note 1. It will be found that, when grace to us is spoken of in John's writings, he speaks of the Father and the Son, when the nature of God or our responsibility, he says God. John 3 and 1 John the 4th of may seem exceptions but are not. It is what God is as such, not personal action and relationship in grace. End of note 1. Note 2. He who had seen him had seen the Father, but here the Apostle speaks of a message and the revelation of his nature. End of note 2. Therefore, if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice truth, our life is a perpetual lie. Walking in the light. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we, believers, have communion with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. These are the great principles, the great features of the Christian position. We are in the presence of God without avail. It is a real thing, a matter of life and of the walk. It is not the same thing as walking according to the light, but it is in the light. That is to say, that this walk is before the eyes of God, enlightened by the full revelation of what He is. It is not that there is no sin in us, but, walking in the light, the will and the conscience being in the light as God is in it, everything is judged that does not answer to it. We live and walk morally in the sense that God is present, and as knowing Him, we walk thus in the light. The moral rule of our will is God Himself, God known. The thoughts that sway the heart come from Himself and are formed upon the revelation of Himself. The Apostle puts these things always in an abstract way. Thus he says, he cannot sin, because he is born of God, and that maintains the moral rule of this life, it is its nature, it is the truth, inasmuch as the man is born of God. We cannot have any other measure of it, any other would be false. It does not follow, alas, that we are always consistent, but we are inconsistent if we are not in this state, we are not walking according to the nature that we possess, we are out of our true condition according to that nature. 
believers having communion with one another in the light. Moreover, walking in the light, as God is in the light, believers have communion with each other. The world is selfish. The flesh, the passions, seek their own gratification. But, if I walk in the light, self has no place there. I can enjoy the light, and all I seek in it, with another, and there is no jealousy. If another possess a carnal thing, I am deprived of it. In the light, we have fellow possession of that which he gives us, and we enjoy it the more by sharing it together. This is a touchstone to all that is of the flesh. As much as one is in the light, so much will we have fellow enjoyment with another who is in it. The Apostle, as we have said, states this in an abstract and absolute way, this is the truest way to know the thing itself. The rest is only a question of realization. Cleansed from all sin by the blood of Jesus Christ, the Christian's need of it, its efficacy and value. In the third place, the blood of Jesus Christ his Son cleanses us from all sin. To walk in the light as God is in it, to have fellowship with one another, to be cleansed from all sin by the blood, these are the three parts of the Christian position. We feel the need there is of the last, for, while walking in the light as God is in the light, with, blessed be God, a perfect revelation to us of himself, with a nature that knows him, that is capable of seeing him spiritually, as the eye is made to appreciate light, for we participate in the divine nature, we cannot say that we have no sin. The light itself would contradict us. But we can say that the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us perfectly from all sin. See note. Through the Spirit we enjoy the light together, it is the common joy of our hearts before God, and while pleasing to Him. A testimony to our common participation in the divine nature which is love also. And our conscience is no hindrance because we know the value of the blood. We have no conscience of sin upon us before God, though we know it is in us but we have the conscience of being clean from it by the blood. But the same light which shows us this, prevents our saying, if we are in it, that we have no sin in us, we should deceive ourselves if we said so, and the truth would not be in us, for if the truth were in us, if that revelation of the divine nature, which is light, Christ our life, were in us, the sin that is in us would be judged by the light itself. If it is not judged, this light, the truth which speaks of things as they are, is not in us. Note. It is not said has nor will. It does not refer to time, but to its efficacy. As I might say such a medicine cures the ague. It is its efficacy, end of note. Sin judged, confessed, forgiven and cleansed, the three things opposed to the truth, to communion. If, on the other hand, we have even committed sin and all, being judged according to the light, is confessed, so that the will no longer take part in it, the pride of that will be no broken down. He is faithful and just to forgive us, and to cleanse us from all iniquity. If we say that we have not sinned, see note, as a general truth, it shows not only that the truth is not in us, but we make God a liar, his word is not in us, for he says that all have sinned. There are three things, we lie, the truth is not in us, we make God a liar. It is this fellowship with God in the light, which in a practical daily Christian life, inseparably connects forgiveness, and the present sense of it by faith, and purity of heart. Note when speaking of sin, the Apostle speaks in the present tense, we have, when speaking of sinning, he speaks in the past. He does not take for granted we are going on doing it. It has been a question whether the Apostle speaks of first coming to the Lord, or subsequent failures. I answer, he speaks in an abstract and absolute way, confession brings through grace, forgiveness. If it is our first coming to God, it is forgiveness, it is in the full and absolute sense. I am forgiven with God, he remembers my sins no more. If it is the subsequent failure, an honesty of heart always confesses, then it is forgiveness as regards the government of God, and the present condition and relationship of my soul with him. But the Apostle, as everywhere, speaks absolutely and of the principle, end of note. Thus we see the Christian position, verse 7, and then the things which, in three different ways, are opposed to the truth, to communion with God in life. The Apostle wrote that which relates to the communion with the Father and the Son, in order that their joy might be full, 